guys, and welcome to another edition of Pro Wrestling Pulse. I'm from Roberto Aquati. I am J-Man. Uh, we've got a special edition for you here on the Pulse today. Um, we're going to be doing our Pulse 10. Uh, we haven't been we haven't done one of these since the beginning of last year. I think we've only done, this will be our third one now. Um, but with um, the Hell in a Cell pay-per-view coming up um, at the end of October, we decided to do our Pulse 10 um, Hell in a Cell matches of all time. So basically, if you haven't seen one of our Pulse 10s before, um, it's basically uh, Quaddy and, and mine conjoined top Quaddy, Quaddy and I. Quaddy and I. Quaddy and I top ten. That sounds retarded. Yeah. So it's my top ten, Quaddy's top ten, and we just put them together basically. Like if, like say in this list, I had one number one, he had one number three, and then our second one we had two and three or something like that. So that first one we made our number one. So we just basically um, combined them both and to make our unanimous top ten, which is our best, or our you know top Hell and Cell matches um, in history here. Uh, I'm gonna get uh, get this kicked off here with number ten. Um, we have Degeneration X versus the McMahon's and Big Show from Unforgiven 2006. Um, this one was the actually the first um, Hell in a Cell where they had the new one, which is the enhanced version where it's like fucking 20 feet tall now, which is not what we're fond of. We're fond of the old school type ones where I remember um, during the um, Randy Taker one where Randy was touching the top of the cell when he was about to go do something on top rope. It just felt more, it feels more confined. It feels more like you're trapped type thing. And that big, that big ass on the cell that they de debuted at Unforgiven 06 here um, just feels massive. You can't even see the top of it. All you see is just the outsides and stuff like that. Um, and uh, it just seemed too, it seems too big. I don't know. We're just more fond of the small, you know, old school type one. Um, yeah, this one was a fun one for sure. Um, definitely going in, we looked like it was going to be a giant clusterfuck. It pretty much did end up at clusterfuck but it worked you know it's just something that ended up working um can't go without mentioning just you know all that shane mcmahon has done in these specialty type matches uh, i know we mentioned him in a previous um pulse episode but everything he does is solid his body and he definitely did it here i know we got, i think we got a coast to coast in this one too um obviously you couldn't have just had uh you know the mcmahon's by themselves against dx it just looks too lopsided so throwing the big show in there i believe at the current time was ecw champion um that was back when big show was just huge just like a giant balloon just blew up like a motherfucker um but yeah it worked here i know they had the ending kind of comedic little part and segment in this matchup where they just had i think they took was it vince's at and vince's shoved it up face. big shows vince's big, face up vince's big, show's big show's ass at the end of this one but um this one definitely i know quite a good on it just super bloody super gory i know one of the last one you know how the cell really um to to really see that in there which is unfortunate we don't see that anymore because really that's you know, what kind of solidifies the Hell in a Cell is the brutality and all that kind of stuff inside of there. But um, this was a fun one here, a, a really enjoyable, unforgiven 06 pay-per-view that had a lot of interesting and really fun stuff on that. But um, DX, McMahon's a big show at our number 10 spot. Yeah, this match was uh, one of those where you're just like, really, we're going to see this? And when they added big show into it, it was just more of a, I guess, just to make sure the one is lopsided, like J-Man said. Um, like, this was one of those matches where going into it, you knew it was going to be a bloody clusterfuck. And uh, there's a couple spots where you're just like, oh, where I think it was Trip it had Sledgehammer across Vince's neck. Yeah, and yeah. they did a super kick yeah, spot or something did. like that. It was just like one of those matches where you had to have all the blood for it to be like, for you to get the whole aspect out of it. Um, one of those last ones before we became the PG, can't show the little kids blood matches because there's no blood in humans. No. So we don't have blood running through our veins. Butterflies and unicorns. Yep. So, uh, interesting match. Uh, great way to start this list because it was one of those where you're just like, every Hell in a Cell, you always think about that one. It, like Jamie said, the communic ending, but just the shit they had and Shane fucking put his body fucking anywhere and everywhere he can. So, yep. uh, that was number 10. We're going to go to number 9 with uh, Taker and Batista Survivor Series 07. Um, we actually talked about this beforehand. Uh, this view lasted the whole year. Um, kind of intriguing to see how Batista could wrestle with a guy like Taker. Batista's more of a wrestling smaller guy. does better, in my opinion. Um, great year-long feud. Uh, good to see Taker actually being used back then. I wish we could see him more. Uh, this match was just like a Hell in a Cell match. Just had to end that feud, but it kind of... Stumbled into a new feud, which we were more excited about with Edge being the cameraman, but I liked it. It was another one of my favorites. But. 
Yeah, this one was enjoyable. I, I like this one as well. Um, like Quade was mentioning how we were talking about the, the whole year-long feud that Taker and Batista had in 2007. They had their uh, matchup at WrestleMania 23 in Detroit, which really you know surprised some people, thinking that Batista really couldn't show up and put something like that on with The Undertaker in a really enjoyable match at WrestleMania 23. had their uh, last main standing match at Backlash 07, which I thoroughly enjoy that entire show, and um, that, uh, that last main standing match is really good stuff. Um, and then we had... Um, you know, Edge take the briefcase from Mr. Kennedy and cash in, become the world champion. I think he'd be like, I believe he got injured in the summer sometime there, I think. I can't really remember. Um, and then, obviously, having Edge be back incorporated in this. I know the poster of this had um, Edge with a chainsaw, and people were yeah. thinking he was going to chainsaw into the fucking Hell in a Cell. And I'm like, that would have been badass, but it probably would have, would have fucked up. The chainsaw would have linked, or, you know, the link in the fucking chain would probably broke or some shit. Um, but yeah, I had him incorporated here in the end of that and then started the, the kind of triple threat feud going out of there. Um, with him being the cameraman and coming in screwing the Undertaker over because this was for the World Championship at the time. But yeah, this was an enjoyable one. Uh, a lot like um, one that probably would have been on my list, but we had to make it into a 10, which was Batista and Triple H from um, Vengeance 05, which I actually enjoy that one as well. Um, but really just showed that, you know, Batista works well in these Hell in a Cell matches and really, you know, he's just that big brute guy, but really kind of becomes that animal, you know, inside that Hell in a Cell really fits to, you know, his character and everything. But uh, both men really performed well in this one and a really cool kind of surprise return ending with Edge at the end of that, which was um, some really good stuff. So we had uh, Taker and Batista from Spy Freeze 07 at number nine. Um, at number eight, uh, we have Triple H versus Chris Jericho from Judgment Day um, 2002. Um, this one, they really put on some really good work. We had a lot of the, you know, obviously the hardcore type cell, you know, kind of situations that you usually get into in, in the cell matches here. But really, you know, with Chris Jericho, who you wouldn't really be prone to seeing in a Hell in a Cell match and really be prone to being in one of these kind of like hardcore matches. A great, just professional wrestler as Chris Jericho is, but he has that side of him that can get into those kind of hardcore and the, the cell matches and stuff like that and can really perform well. I mean, this one was really the one with uh, Tim White, where I think it was his last fucking match that everybody talks about, where he just got destroyed and hit off the cage and all busted open and shit. So back when they used to have ref bumps all the time, which was, you know, really cool to see sometimes in those matchups. Um, I believe this one ended with a pedigree on the top of the cell. I remember Jericho in a recent, or not a recent interview, one I saw a couple uh, or a month or so ago where he's saying, like, God, I really just hope this fucking cell doesn't break in and I'm just going straight down face first. But um, I know that spot was pretty cool. And, uh, yeah, just a really well-worked match. I know it's kind of just a blow-off to their type year-long feud that they were having. Not year-long feud, just half-year uh, feud that they had going on when Jericho was on the speed champion at the beginning of 02 and then lost to Triple H at um, WrestleMania 18. And then they kind of had their little blow-off in the um, cell and uh, Judgment Day here. Um, but yeah, this is an enjoyable one for sure. Uh, really put on great work and really um, continue to solidify as Triple H is one of the main you know guys you always look at at in a Hell in a Cell, which you'll continue to see um, down this list here. But a really quality one in Judgment Day 02 there. It's sad that this match is more, most known for is that Tim White spot. Yeah, it really um, is. This match was actually really good. Um, I thought it was great to see Jericho in one of these. Uh, like Jeremy said, he's really not well known for being a Hell in a Cell type wrestler. Right. As if you look at this list, you have the Triple H and Undertaker in almost every single one of these. Um, seeing Jericho in one of these matches kind of, like, I guess, surprised a lot of people, like Jamie was saying. Um, he was in ECW, he was in WCW, but he was more known as a cruiserweight guy, the light heavyweight champion, stuff like that. Um... But it didn't really matter who he was in one of those with. He could perform, and he could put a great match on. So um, nice seeing Jericho in one of these. Uh, be intriguing to see if he didn't do one of these, if his career would have lasted longer. Mm. It's kind of something with Edge, but you don't hear that there. But uh, that was number eight. eight. Number seven it was one that I really would have liked to see differently, but uh, Taker and Trip at WrestleMania 29. 28. 28. Um, with Sean as a referee. It's uh, been great to see, like I was talking to Jamie when we were doing these lists, if it would have ended where they both would have been done. Both would have hang him up, both could have gone to the Hall of Fame, we could continue on. But when you have one of these, and the, the way that ended with them, both, all three of them going up the ramp, and just where they could just, okay, we're done, and it wrap up, and career, good career for both of you. But they both had matches afterwards. It didn't, the aspect of it, the whole hell in a cell, thing didn't really, how it would have ended it where, 27, where Taker couldn't even get up, and all this, and then just would have wrapped up his career, and 28 would have been good, but then we got to see the Lesnar beat him at 30. Right. This one, definitely one of the most anticipated Hell in a Cell matches in history, with two of the most quintessential, the most quintessential guys, and, you know, Hell in a Cell 
um, you know, history um, with the guys that really just dominated the Hell in a Cell match throughout its entire, you know, creation. Um, if that made any sense. Um, but yeah, this one definitely one that we would hope to end it differently. Um, love the aspect of Sean being added in there with the, the amount of history that Sean has with all these guys and classifying it as the end of an era and at a time where you realize both these guys' careers were winding down and they didn't need to be in there all the time and have all these, you know, these matches and stuff like that. Um, it could have just ended perfectly if you just ended it there. You know, you have Taker win, you keep the fucking streak, um, and, you know, go off in the sunset, what they did. I, I loved the end of this match. I know the first time we watched it, it was kind of something to where uh, we just didn't really get it. Like, we didn't get, we didn't get where they are coming, because it was a lot of slow, methodical storytelling moments. When you go back and rewatch that, you really get all of it, and you kind of just kind of get it in waves, and it's just like, man, that was great. They told an amazing story in this matchup, which really is this era of storytelling that they're really trying to get over in the past couple of years. Um, but yeah, just really great storytelling here with a Sean involvement and him trying to help Triple H and super kick and taker and still couldn't end it, um, with all the chair shots and everything. I mean, this was, you know, really, um, what you would get when you get Triple H and the Undertaker in there. Not really what we would have seen 10 years or so ago, but really what we get now with the storytelling that these guys provide and just everyone that was in there, just amazing storytellers, some of the best of all time. Um, so yeah, really quality stuff there. WrestleMania 28. Um, as the end of the era Hell in a Cell match um, that we had there, quote-unquote. Quote unquote. Um, next up at number six, um, we had Triple H versus Cactus Jack, Cactus Jack from No Way Out 2000. Um, I know they had a lot of stips on this one that was for the WWF title at the time. Um, coming after just the the show stealing and the kind of creating of Triple H's, you know, badass character that we would get from here on out um, at Royal Rumble 2000 with the amazing street fight that um, Cactus Jack and Triple H had there that really Cactus Jack went in and just made Triple H um, and went out there and showed like, yeah, he could go out there and have those brutal type matches with the most brutal type guy um, in a McFoley and have him go out there and be like, okay, shit, his, this guy's a player and this guy's going to be something to see. And that's, you know, really what Cactus Jack did here. And he, he made Triple H into the person that we know and into the guy that can be in these Hell in a Cell matches and be like, shit, you know, Triple H in a Hell in a Cell, this, whoever's in there with him is fucked type of feeling. Um, so, yeah, this is some really good stuff. They had Cactus Jack's career on the line, which we all know. Um, going into WrestleMania 2000 that year, he ended up coming back. And, you know, he, he says all the time, he's like, you wish that would have been a perfect ending because having in the Hell in a Cell and having how JR had the send-off of, you know, we'll miss you, Cactus, or whatever the fuck he said, I can't remember. Um, but yeah, this one was some really good stuff. Had some brutal stuff in this one. As this was, you know, quintessential Attitude Era type time. We had him get outside of the cell, go up top. Had the fucking uh, the uh, two by four wrapped in barbed wire, lit it on fire, and did that whole spot on the top of the cell. And then we had the the backdrop spot going through the cell and back through the fucking ring. Um, just can't, we can't go without mentioning what fucking Mick Foley does, which we'll get to it later. Obviously, just with his body, just, just blows our minds. Um, but yeah, really some good stuff here and continue to solidify Triple H as that main guy with times where you'd have, you know, Rock out and you, you had Austin out for this big time period. They had to really start solidifying some top stars and this is when they just made Triple H um, into just the shit. And in 2000, Triple H, I mean, go back and look at some of that shit. He's just a fucking monster, man, I tell you. And then end up really into 01 before his injury. But um, great stuff here from uh, No Way Out 2000 between uh, Triple H and Jack. Like Jay said, there was a lot of people missing around this time. You had the Rock Out, you had Austin Out. You really didn't have that much like high top players yet. You didn't have the Edge yet. You didn't have Christian yet. You had guys coming up. But it seemed like Cactus Jack McFoley realized that Triple H could be something if he had one or two good matches, which would catch people's eyes. And this is what he did for Triple H with that street fight where they're like, oh, this guy can actually go. And then you put him in a hell in a cell with Cactus Jack, who will literally, there's another, he's on this list again, will literally put his body through anything just to get somebody over right. or just to make people go, what the fuck just happened? Right. So when you have this match going into it, it was just like, this was before SIT or internet and all that, so you really didn't know. You thought Cactus Jack was done. Okay. Everybody was like, oh, he's done. Good to see Mick Foley wrestle for a while, great career and all that. But then he came back at WrestleMania that year. But seeing Triple H just become that big monster he was, and this was just another stepping stone to show how great he it really is and how he could put it on great matches. So great. good match for this one. Um, moving on to number five. five. Number five, we have Edge and Taker at SummerSlam 08. Uh, this actually goes kind of hand in hand with Batista and uh, Taker. Um, this began with Edge uh, hitting Taker in the face of the camera with him and Batista and just straight another year feud. And that's kind of what uh, Taker was kind of good for back then. 
he was one of those veterans that could go a whole year and wrestle the same guy over and over and put still put on good matches. Right. Um, in this view with Edge, who is just kind of, I don't know, still up and coming or... No, he, he at least solidified he, his spot. Yeah, sure, he, he yeah. was there for... I'm kind of a little fuzzy on this match, but uh, he he was there for a while, so having Edge and Taker wrestle as Hell in Cell kind of put Edge's name up there in the bright lights where he could actually go, so... Yeah, this one, um, I, I thoroughly enjoyed this one. Really, uh, like Quaddy was talking about the whole year-long feud that really did start at Survivor Series, and they had their WrestleMania 24 match, which main evented WrestleMania 24. Um, and then they went to the TLC match, where I think they had it where Taker's career was on the line, and this TLC, and the TLC was uh, really enjoyable. I think that was one night stand oh wait. Um, Hold on, what company was that? That was not ECW. They just took the one night stand name, Dick. Um, but yeah, really enjoyable TLC match. They had, you know, Taker be, you know, took some time off there. They're saying he was, he was done and all this shit. And then they started in with the whole, you know, the Vicky side of things where turning Edge and Vicky against each other. And they did the whole shit where, you know, Edge was caught cheating or whatever. I think he was like making out to Leisha Fox. Well, Leisha Fox. Leisha Fox. Ma- married. And them shit. Is that their marriage and all that? Yeah, they were like showing that camera footage or whatever. And then Vicky went all scorn woman crazy shit. And, uh, Born woman crazy. Watch what? out. Hashtag did, that shit. Did your daddy get you that dictionary he, he wanted from the Watch out. Yeah, he did. Um, and uh, Vicky went and reinstated The Undertaker and made the, the main event Hell in a Cell match with nothing on it because he didn't need anything on it. Um, these guys go out there and just tell a great story, and that's what Edge is all about. He's all about going you know, out there and telling a great story. And he looked like that just crazy. He had to go out there. I knew they had a great segment on a SmackDown around then with Edge and McFoley, where McFoley's like, I, I have to see the old school Edge that I got in the ring with at WrestleMania 22 and saw the diabolical side of that. I need to see that. And Edge is like, you're going to see it. And they just destroyed McFoley and really got over the fact that, holy shit, you know, Edge is really, you know, he's got that diabolical side. Because normally, like, like at Chris Jericho, you normally see him just in a, a great wrestling type match. But you see Edge in all these type the TLCs and the fucking ladder matches that, he, you know, he's, you know, really just made his own. Um, and going in there in the house, South the Undertaker stood up, and nobody thought that it was like, well, you know, it's not going to be, you know, competable with, you know, what we're getting in there. But we totally saw face to face with like Edge Taker, shit, this is going to be fucking crazy. We've seen Edge, the master of the TLC in the ladder matches, and Taker, the master of the Hell in a Cell, getting them both in there at the same time. This is fucking gold right here, um, and it really was great stuff here. We incorporated the ladders and the tables inside of the cell, which is great stuff. Um, and then had the, the ending spot where I think he choke slammed him through the thing, the, the fire fucking whatever kind of shit towards the end of this. But uh, really great stuff with Edge and Taker here from 08 and really an enjoyable feud that I loved um, back in the summer, of the, the the spring and summer of 2008, which was some really great stuff with Edge and the Undertaker at that time. Wish we could go back to then. Missing Edge right now, like seriously, like hardcore. Yeah. But it could be incorporated into this stuff. So I'm fortunate with all the amazing matches that he put himself through and now I'm capable of, you know, with the injuries that he's had. But God, he would be a... Amazing asset to this roster. I just want right to go now. back to 2008 where I didn't have really a really whole lot of responsibility. Yeah, me too. That's what I was thinking. I was like, man, I watched a lot more wrestling back then, it seems like. A lot heavier, too. I was talking with Nicole about that, too. I was like, God, it just seems like I just, you know, went to school and watched wrestling all the time. That's all I fucking did. Went to Taco Bell. I was, yeah, just oh, good times. Um, next up at number four, we're getting to the kind of nitty gritty here. Um, we had The Undertaker and Brock Lesnar from No Mercy 02. Um, this is some great stuff. Um, a lot along the lines with Cactus Jack and Triple H in 2000. This was where something where, you know, they had the Undertaker go out there, take this young kid and a Brock Lesnar that just came in. He just destroyed Hulk Hogan. He just destroyed the Rock at SummerSlam, the youngest undisputed champion in history. Take him and just fucking groom him into, you know, the monster and the fucking just amazing freakish fucking athlete. And then what we, you know, he turned into um, in the WWE. Take him and groom him into a professional wrestler and, and what he can do here. And that's what the Undertaker did. That's what the Undertaker did with a lot of people. Um, but in this Hell in a Cell matchup, this was some really great stuff. Some brutal shit, some gory shit. We had a lot of blood in this. The Heyman element. Heyman was busted open. He wasn't even inside the fucking cell. He was busted open. Um, I know they're going into this one. I think this is where they had um, the cask or the um, cast on, yeah, on, on Taker's arm. And they are all trying to get you know the, the cast off fucking Taker's arm the entire match. And uh, I remember that spot where they had him, his arm tied up with that fucking belt. And he just beat the shit out of him with that chair. Yeah. And the belt broke. Just great spots in here, um, and just just showing his athleticism, you know, Lesnar's athleticism in here with Taker, and um, really just a new breed of a Hell in a Cell match kind of here. It was kind of like the old meeting the new version of what the fuck's going on in these, you know, Cell matches. You get this freakish athlete with, again, like we were talking with Edge and Taker, um, with the quintessential Hell in a Cell guy and the Undertaker, um, and just what we were going to get out of that, because, you know, we were looking at the Undertaker as almost the underdog going into his own match with just a Brock Lesnar that was just a fucking monster at that time. 
Um, so this was some great stuff, really solidified, started to solidify, you know, Brock Lesnar at that main top star around that 2 3 period, which is some really great stuff with him. Um, so thoroughly enjoyed this one from a great No Mercy 2002 pay-per-view. I just remember this match, just all the blood, and then just seeing Heyman still bleeding, and he's happy ass to even get in that match. Um, this, this feud, and like Jamin said, Taker literally had to take Lesnar hand by hand and goes, this is what we're doing here. And you can tell Taker, this is why probably Taker likes Lesnar now because he helped him become right. the monster he is. Right. And he just took him step by step. We're going to do this here. We're going to do this here. You're going to attack me on a SmackDown and break my hand and all that shit. And it's just all that just like went hand in hand. And we got in this match where it's like, what the hell are we going to see? Are we just going to see a complete squash by Lesnar? Because he's such a monster, this take can actually go. This match was really good. This is one of those Hell in a Cell where, if you've never seen it, it's one of them you have to watch. And like, the, literally the next four down, you yeah. have to. If you haven't seen a Hell in a Cell, if you're getting into WWE, these last four are the ones you have to see. Yep. But with Lesnar just coming in and like Jamin said, beating Hogan, kind of washed up Hogan. Then you have you have him beat The Rock, who's still people's champ and all that. Then you have him face this monster and take her. And you really didn't know what you are going to see until you had the little voice inside Heyman just fucking just spark something take her, spark something in Lesnar, and that's what made this match so beautiful and so great as it is. Yeah. Ooh, number four. Three. We're on number three now. We have the Armageddon six-man. Uh, we had Stone Cold, Rock, Trip, Taker, Angle, and Rikishi. God. What, Still what, to this day, <laughs> like... So man. <laughs> what a list. Um, and this match, like I remember watching this match. I, I wasn't watching wrestling as much as I was back then, as I am now. But just going to this match, I just remember thinking this is gonna be a giant clusterfuck. I don't really know what's gonna happen, and it just fucking everyone showed up except for Rikishi. Yes, he got thrown off the top. He did. But uh, this match was just one of those matches where. There's so much going on. If you literally looked away, blinked your eyes, you would miss something. Yep. And that's what Hell in a Cell should be. It shouldn't. There's a couple matches that should be drawn out for the storytelling part on two on two or one on one. But when there's that many people in there, you have so much shit going on. You have to watch it once or twice to see what all happened. Um, really, don't know a whole lot about the story behind it, but I just remember Angle went in it. Actually, I forgot Angle was in it, but. <laughs> Yeah, this um, this is called Ten Year Old J Man Jizz Fest here. Um, holy shit! I I still remember around this time, um, just being just awed by just how this is always my match for the longest time before I really you start to get incorporated with other shit like that. This was always the one I was like, this is the coolest match ever. Like you literally just have every quintessential person in the Attitude Era at this time in the most fun fucking you know gimmick match that you possibly have built up with everything around it, you know, Vince all freaking out that all his, his assets and all his, his entire company is going to shit because all these guys are going to get destroyed in this fucking hell in a cell. And um, This is just, this is Attitude Era at its best right here, and that's why it's so high on this list because, I mean, you can't get any fucking, I mean, good lord, this, the names that are in this alone, it's like a fucking dream car besides Rikishi, who at the time was being built up, um, had his feet with The Rock um, at the end of 2000. I know the Heather Survivor Series match uh, the month before this. You had, um, you know, Austin just getting incorporated back in. He had this match with Triple H at Survivor Series, that No Holds Barred match. Um, you had Taker and Angle. Ever since everything happened in Survivor Series, you had Austin and Trip. You had Rock and Rikishi, and you had Taker and Angle for the WF title um, at Survivor Series before. Hmm, that's weird. You have all those things incorporated, and then you build to another thing. How oh, fucking random is that? Um, they, they don't do that now. They were on their shit there. That's so weird that you just Wasn't take that things and continue. Era? It wasn't. No, he was gone. He was in over WCW fucking that shit up. Sinking that ship. Um, hey, welcome, Robert. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, this is, I mean, I, you can't really just say anything. It's just like your just jaw has dropped the entire time you're watching this match. You're like what Quaddy was saying. Just, just shit happening every fucking second of that match. It's like a, I don't even know how long it is, like probably 20-something minutes or whatever. The whole fucking time, you are not, there's not one part where you're like, oh, okay, oh, shit, that was cool. You're literally just like, oh, shit, oh, shit, oh, shit, like the whole fucking time. Six of the biggest guys, you know, and well, five of the biggest guys in Rikishi, um, in wrestling fucking history, um, just going out there and just putting on spot after spot, just crazy shit. You had the Rikishi spot where he got thrown off the fucking top through the fucking 
um, down into that like mulch truck or whatever that Vince and you know the Stooges brought out trying to bring the cell down. Like I'm gonna bring this damn thing back to Connecticut or whatever the fuck he said, um, trying to bring it out. Bring and, it up the rear, bring it up the rear of Patterson. Um, and then had Angle retain out of nowhere. Everybody's saying like, oh shit, maybe Awesome get back or fucking Rock will get it or take it or something like that or trip maybe. And then just have Angle retain it in there. The most the guy that you wouldn't see out of any of this, the most unhardcore type guy, Kurt Angle getting the retain out of this matchup. This is just. Attitude Era, fucking jizz fest at its best. I mean, just that dream cards type stuff here that they built up um, at the end of 2000 with this Armageddon six man, which will still is one of the most infamous fucking you know cell matches in history. All right, next up, get to number two. Um, this one for me was not a tough one. I know this was Quaddy's number one. Um, this one was the one I was either because I actually had that Armageddon six man number two on my list. Um, this one is our um, number two here. We have The Undertaker and Mankind from King of the Ring 98. I know a lot of people are like, holy shit, well, that might have been my number one. You know, it's his our opinion. Uh, it was Quaddy's number one. It was not my number one. But um, it's definitely worthy of it, for sure. Um, this is the match, I mean, that you think about that, I mean, is something you look back. It's just highlight real shit. Every time you see it, it's still, you know, fucking, I'm just in awe. Every time I see that spot um, with Taker, you know, throwing Mankind off the top through the fucking, you know, announce table, it's just still something that doesn't even seem real. It just doesn't even seem real. Uh, it's, um, it, it was amazing. I mean, and at that time, as a fucking eight-year-old kid seeing that shit, it just blows your mind. I mean, it just literally, you're like in like candy land, like just fucking fantasy land. The whole, it's like, is this real? Are those real human beings throwing people off of 16-foot fucking cells onto concrete? Like, is this shit real? Um, but it really wasn't even a match. I mean, it was just because it started, Foley said um, that, you know, he watched the, the Sean and Taker match from 97, um, that, you know, I have to try to, up, you know, do this. I have to, you know, he's sitting there with Terry Funk. He's like, I don't know how the hell I'm going to upstage, you know, Shawn Michaels in there with The Undertaker. How the hell am I going to do it? Um, and he's, you know, Terry Funk said, he's like, well, why don't you start on the top of the cell? And he's like, all right. <laughs> so <laughs> fucking Mankind goes up with a chair, throws a chair up there and starts it you know, on top of the cell. And then it just, just chaos from there. And that's where he got thrown off and went back up and, Choke slam through and fucking tooth and shit sticking out of his nose because it came out of it. It's just, it, it blows your mind when you sit down and watch that still to this day. I mean, however many fucking over a decade later, I mean, it just, it, it's insane. And it's one of those ones that, like Quaddy was saying, if you, well, a lot of these, if you haven't seen these matches, go fucking do it. Because, I mean, it's just some of the most famous and craziest fucking matches in professional wrestling history. And this one is really one that just, it blew everybody's minds for years and years and still fucking does to this day. Um, just what McFoley will do with his body to entertain people um, for the product. Just you, you can't go without saying. And um, for everything that he's done, we can only thank McFoley um, because of the all the amazing moments. And, you know, Taker just looking like a fucking god in this match. I still remember the spot where they brought this stretcher out to get uh, Mankind off the concrete whenever he got thrown out there. And Taker's just standing on the top just like a fucking beast. Like, it just... You couldn't get over Taker as a hard-ass more. You couldn't get over the you know, underdog, fucking do anything to his body type thing for Mankind anymore in the in this match, and um, just amazing. And then he still had, still tried to work a match after all this, where Mankind is literally just a bag of fucking bones standing on his two feet. It just blows my mind how he still got through that. Um, but just one of the most famous matches in history goes without saying. Anybody watching this show knows why the fuck, you know, this, this shit's on here. It's just... Awesome to still, still to this day with Taker and Mankind from King of the Ring '98. There's kind of a bit of a debate whenever Take or when uh, Foley got inducted to the Hall of Fame, and people question, "Oh, he only had title for this much, this much." If you have to, if you question this, you have to go back and see the retirement match versus Trip and that street fight, and then you have to see this match because, like Jamie said, I was an eight and a half year old boy. Boy, and, boy, boy, little eight and a half year old boy, 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 boy. and uh. I didn't watch it live. I just remember seeing like like bits and pieces on like the news and stuff of all oh, this guy, and then just Jr. pretty much just put icing on his cake of going, "He's dead, yeah. he's dead," and then the, God is my witness, he's broken in half. And the part that everybody forgets is they remember that spot where he flew off into the announce table. The other spot most people don't remember is where he got thrown through the cell. And then the other funny part is whenever Terry Funk got choke slammed and she <laughs> fell off. Yes. But this match is one of those Hell in Cell matches. That's why it's number one on my list. It's one of those Hell in Cell matches. If you Google WWE Hell in a Cell, this guarantee you picture first picture it should be. Not knowing what 
fucking internets now. Right. Fucking probably something Kevin Nash and Triple H or something. <laughs> but uh, it's probably that match because it's one of those where it's like, oh, this is what this match can do. That first match, first one with Sean and uh, Taker is the, literally the first one. This one was just like, okay, like Terry Funk said and Mick Foley said, you have to do better. You have to step up from what the last one did. So, and uh, it's kind of funny. Um, what was it? A year later, they don't have, they have a pay per view named after it. So, no, they didn't have it. It's so, called Hell in a Cell. So we no. didn't have it shoved down our throat. So it was like an no. like an excitement. It made it big. Like any time they needed a Hell in a Cell, they used it instead of fitting it into a Hell in a Cell. They actually used it when it was needed. Yeah, that yeah. That, that, that worked real well. Yeah, yeah. But this is one of those other matches you have to see for what me and J Man can say. Will not put aspect to you watching it live right. or you watching it now. Right. Me watching it now, still I still get chills whenever he flies off it because literally if he t- a foot too far or a foot too short, yeah, shit, we may not have Nick Foley anymore. He's dead. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. That was number two. Ready for number one, guy? Let's do it. Sure. I think we're ready. Are I they? think everybody knows. Are, are they ready by this time? I think so. Truth, are you ready? Ready? Ready, Truthy? Uh, it's Bad Blood, what year? 97. Shawn Michaels versus The Undertaker. This is the, literally the first one. This is the first stepping stone. Nobody really knew what the fuck they were getting, we're getting in ourselves into. Um, this was actually in our hometown. I'll get to it. <laughs> Damn. Um, I remember watching this, like, just recently, because I was on WWE Network for 999. Um... <laughs> <laughs> Way to go, JBL. Yeah. <laughs> come on, come on, kickstart. Um, yeah. yeah, you do. We're all fucking, we're all pre-show <laughs> yeah. <in> right now. <laughs> just this match, just alone, I watched it recently, and it still is one of those matches where that storyline behind it between Trip and, or not Trip, but uh, Taker and, I'm going to keep changing Trip, between Taker and Sean. I don't Shawn, know, he hasn't been on every other one. On yeah. <laughs> uh, Taker and Sean, just the whole aspect of these two feud, and this was in 1997, so there really wasn't a whole lot of other big names around. Um, you had The Rock, you had The Austins and all that, but when you really thought of WWE, you thought of this up-and-comer, the sexy boy, Shawn Michaels, and then you thought of the dead man, The Undertaker. And then we got a new aspect in this whole match and Kane coming out. So just the whole, like, the end of this was a whole clusterfuck, in my opinion, just the way Kane came out and then Shawn just literally crawled and just put his arm on it to end it. Um, this is... I'm thinking about it now. This is probably 1B on my top 10. Um, this is the whole aspect of this, the whole storytelling in this match, and the whole aspect after this match. Because it wasn't like, okay, we're going to have this hell and sell, and everybody's done. We're all just going to... They stepped, They set themselves up to do more. Because they could make it a triple threat. They could make it... They could do all sorts like, different things. It's like another puzzle. Now... And fucking current wrestling, they're just like, okay, we're gonna do this, and then next month we're gonna. Uh, no idea. They, we're playing for the future, is what they're doing. So, good job, Daddy. You fucking did great on this one. Yeah, um, this is a game changer. This is a wrestling history changer. Um, this is, you know, this is the one that you really think about that just changed everything. Uh, this was the, the time where. You know, WCW was was getting, you know, just whooping WWF's ass because, you know, WWF was still doing their new generation shit, and they started to change it up. They're like, we're going to need to change something or we're going to fucking go under. Um, you know, you had, um, you know, Sean doing a shit with the X, and they started all this stuff up. You had Taker doing stuff. You had Austin starting to get incorporated in there, which he already did stuff for about a year and a half by that point. But um, this is just like, this is the future. This is what's going to be going down. And this is why we have pay-per-views named fucking Hell in a Cell. This is why we see the, you know, the biggest shit go down in a Hell in a Cell match because of what Sean and the Undertaker did um, in this first ever matchup. And Aquati was mentioning to get the backstory up first. This was in St. Louis, our hometown. Um, I was a little fucking jacked up seven-year-old um, wanting to fucking be down there to see this shit because I was a huge Shawn Michaels fan. Always have been. He's always been my guy and ever since I was fucking seven years old when I first started watching doing the fucking pose in my fucking mom's apartment. Um, but this was the one that we wanted to, we were like, all right, we're going to do this shit. We're going to take this for me and my dad. And my dad's buddy, we're going to do it. And we're like, 
oh, we're not going to be able to do it, Justin. I'm sure I probably fucking cried like a motherfucker and was all pissed off and shit. But I still, to this day, remember driving over to watch it. I still, to this day, remember driving home with my dad. She dropped me off, or he dropped me off at my mom's house. And I could not sleep that entire night because I was a little seven-year-old seeing Kane fucking rip the door off. I thought he was going to do that to my door and come and fucking kill me or something. Um, that's just one of those things that sticks with you. I mean, it just, it, it's always stuck with me. I still, I still remember watching this fucking decade plus later. I mean, it, as a seven-year-old, like, that's, that's shit. And it sticks with people even when, you know, I was talking with somebody that, um, I used to work with or whatever that attended that show live, and he was still, it's still just in your mind because you realize it's just, it's history being made right in front of your face. It's, it's, you, that's it. That's the same feeling that I got, you know, at Money in the Bank in 2011 when I saw Punk and Cena. Oh, that whole match will never come out of my head. It's, I will remember that forever. And tons of other things. The WrestleManias I've been to, all that will be ingrained in my fucking wrestling memory forever because this is, those are those moments that just change shit and things that are just histories made on that day. And that is something that happened in October of 1997 um, at this first ever Hell in a Cell match. Um, just the work that they put on here. It's Shawn Michaels and The Undertaker. I mean come the fuck on. Who wouldn't think this shit's gonna be fucking awesome? But just what they did in this match, because we didn't know what to expect. You didn't know what the hell they were gonna do. You thought they were just gonna wrestle inside of this confined cell, you know, like you've seen in cage matches and this and that and all that kind of shit. You didn't think they were gonna get outside of it, start climbing up the side 16 feet and, you know, get pulled off and Sean would go through the fucking table and having the debut of which they were trying to set up, you know, the, the brother of the Undertaker's gonna be coming and long lost younger brother, all this shit, and having Kane debut with that and rip the fucking door off and help Sean win and start, you know, Taker and Kane. I mean, this just changed everything and just made history right then and there. Um, changed the pace for the whole, you know, Monday Night Wars and everything because people started to fucking like, holy shit, if we're going to be seeing this stuff now, like, how the hell can we not watch this? I mean, it, it just changed everything. The work that these men put on was outstanding. Sean's role in it of trying to be the kind of the, the cowardly running away heel, which, you know, Sean played brilliantly in that, the whole DX time period, and, you know, Taker just looking like a fucking god in this match. I mean, just like he did in the, the, the you know, Mankind, Mankind match at King of the Ring, um, just looked like a fucking, like the devil was chasing you, I mean, in this fucking entire match, and just told an amazing story, and went out there into, as Sean, you know, Sean put it in a, a interview when he was talking about this, he's like, I have this to work with? Holy shit, I can do so many things with this, and that's what you do, you just give... It's like giving little t little kids, you know, toys in the playground. You know, they're they're just gonna go out there and play, and that's what these guys did. They you give them this to work off of, they're just gonna be, you know, kids in a fucking playground and just doing their shit. And that's exactly what they did here, and just you know, changed everything and just marked it as like this is this is it, and this is the shit that we're gonna be looking forward to when there's a big feud built up, and we need that blow off. Put it in the cell because Sean and Taker made it the match that we have to see. Whoever's going down, who's ever you know is fucking feuding and all this kind of shit. Put him in the cell, and that, that'll end it, because that's exactly what we saw here. Um, so, our not unanimous, but our conjoined number one was my number one. I think Quaddy's number two. Is that yep. correct? So, um, but yeah, our number one on our Pulse Ten Hell in a Cell matches: Shawn Michaels and the Undertaker from Bad Blood '97. Um, we have our honorable mentions down in the comment box. I might have five or so or something. In the last one, we had a bunch. I probably won't put a whole bunch. Um, for you guys out there, comment, put your top ten. What do you guys think about ours? You guys think we're way the fuck off? You guys, you know, think we're on? Whatever you guys think, put yours down there. Um, we'd like to see it. So, you know, see the differences and all that kind of stuff. Um, we kind of just wanted to do this one. I haven't done one of these in a while. And with Hell in a Cell pay-per-views coming up, or the, the pay-per-view coming up, um, <clears throat> just thought we'd throw this out there. It'd be a fun one for you guys. Um, but yeah, this one I'll wrap up our Pulse 10 Hell in a Cell matches um, for my partner Quaddy. I am J-Man, and thank you guys for watching another edition of Wrestling Pulse, Pulse, Russian Wrestling World.